good morning. And I hope you will uh, do just that. This is the time of year where our friends will come. I'm praying for my one. Our staff has been talking about this for some time. Who's your one? I want you to really think about that. Talk about it. Um, I'm praying for Austin. Austin and I have had conversations before. I see him out in community. He's not a churchgoer. He's a self-proclaimed agnostic. So we've talked about that. I'm looking for opportunity to invite him. I see him periodically, and I can't wait to see him in this room, by the way. Um, and I won't call him out like I just did, but I'm praying for him, praying for Mike, praying for John, praying for Bryce. I've got friends that are, you know, I run into here and there, whether it's at a coffee shop or at the gym or somewhere, um, neighbors, a couple of those who I'm just praying for will be with us here. I was in a group this morning we're praying over and people around my small circle just calling out names that we would reach out to those who do not yet know the Lord. So you have opportunity there. You can see it. Um, Who's your one? We've got um, some cards available as well in the commons. They look like this. There's different uh, cards. These are all around, in fact. And you can just give them to somebody and say, hey, here's the info uh, that I was talking about. Would love for you to come. So let's be, let's be bold. Let's be loving and bold as we invite our friends to come this Easter. All right. Hey, grab your Bible. We'll get there in a moment. We're going to be in the book of Matthew. I hope you have your Bible. Isn't that amazing? We've got Bibles. And some of us don't use them. All right. So there's the first rebuke of the morning. But I've got more. We've got more than that that's coming. Um, let me start with this. So there was a guy who was looking for a job. He was kind of desperate, uh, unemployed. And he went, you know, he'd always loved animals. And so he went to the zoo and, and he met with the zookeeper. He said, man, I, just, I need a job and I'll do anything. Like, I'm, I'm kind of desperate. I'll clean the cages where the animals are. I'll, cl- I mean, I'll, I'll clean up poop. You know, I'll do whatever it takes. And the zookeeper said, well, we don't really have any jobs right now, but, um, you know, come back in a few weeks or something. Maybe we'll have. And he goes, no, 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 no. Listen, I'm telling you, I will do anything. And the guy kind of saw this passion in him. He said, man, I need to hire a guy like this. And he says, I'll tell you what. Here's an idea. Um, we don't have a job like, you know, cleaning up, you know, cages and such. But we recently lost our gorilla. Uh, the gorilla died. And I'll tell you what, if you put on this gorilla suit um, and get in the cage, jump around and you're just like a gorilla. I mean, here's the main attraction. You've got yourself a job. And the guy was like, man, my mom didn't raise me to be a gorilla, but um, man, I'm kind of desperate. I'll, I'll take it. So sure enough, he goes first day, gets in the cage. He's jumping around, beating his chest, trying to do his best gorilla. And the people, the onlookers were like, man, this, this is legit. This gorilla is amazing. And so he got pretty enthusiastic. He started swinging, you know, ropes and stuff, climbing trees. And he, and he got so enthusiastic, in fact, that he, um, he swung right out of the cage that keeps the gorilla. And he went over the wall and he landed into the habitat where they keep the lion. And <laughs> thank you. And, and true story. And so he so he ends up uh, he bam lands on his back. No sooner had he caught his breath than he felt the hot breath of the lion on top of him. And he couldn't handle it anymore. I mean, so he just burst out. He says, "Help, somebody save me." And the people were shocked to hear like a gorilla yelling such a thing <laughs> or yelling anything, saying anything. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. And, and so then he heard a voice coming from within the lion. <laughs> Shut up. You're going to get both of us fired. <laughs> okay, so not an authentic animal in the whole zoo, evidently. Um, do you ever, you know, just wearing a mask, right? Playing a part. I wonder if you ever feel, <laughs> I guess a couple things. Do you ever feel like this? That like, is there a real animal in my whole zoo? Yeah, I'm calling your family, I guess, a zoo. Uh, where you work, in the church. I mean, it seems like, you know, am I, am I wearing a mask, right? I mean, the thing that's so wild is when we start to get really honest, is it possible that, and we all do, don't we? We all wear masks. We do it in our families. We do it in relationships. We, man, this goes way back to the garden, right? When we were in Genesis in the early part of this year, if you were here. I mean, we, now we, we said that, you know, social media has become the digital fig leaf where we're hiding, right? Immediately, when we fall into sin, we know we're, we're sinners. We're all shamed about certain things. We don't want people to know the darkest, deepest secrets. That, I mean, there's time appropriate for that. But in Christian relationships, we do share our weaknesses. We do share our failures. 
The Bible says confess your sins one to another. That's the power of the church, the power of our small groups and our connect groups, that we don't do life isolated. We do it as believers together. And part of that is being honest and then being accountable. We say we're only, you're only as sick as your secrets. The etymology of that word secret is actually to be divided. Two different things. The biblical word for, for all this mask wearing, putting on the gorilla suit, the lion suit, um, the biblical term is hypocrites. It's a transliterated word, which means two-faced, an actor. It's someone on stage, right? You, you've heard this maybe. It was the word that was used for someone on stage who's acting a part, playing a part. And I just want to say mass confession, okay? First from me, okay, but all of us, we are all, I am, you are closer to a hypocrite than you think you are. And Jesus had some strong words to say about those who are hypocrites. So we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 15. And uh, you go ahead and turn there in your Bible. I hope that you'll bring your Bible. I don't know if you think, well, that's kind of old school. No, okay, no, bring your Bible. Because that's the text of this course always. And it's what we're going to look at today. Uh, I'm going to put the words, and maybe you know we enable you. We're going to put the words on the screen, but that's to help us out. Uh, we can see God's word. We have it in our language. Praise be to God. I want to talk about four ways that our practices can lead to this kind of um, hypocrisy, can lead us astray. And we're going to talk today about traditions and how they can lead us to certain places where we don't want to go. We're looking at this series, the word spoken by the word. Uh, we're saying the word, Jesus, right? The word in the flesh, speaking the word of God. And he's going to do that today. So Matthew 15, 1 through 20. The first thing I want you to see, and I'm going to break this down as we walk through it, uh, four different points along the way. The first one is our traditions can lead to a misguided perspective, all right, to a misguided perspective. Look at this. Here's how it starts out. Chapter 15, verse 1. Then Pharisees and scribes, okay, they've been, they've been in the story lately if you've been here much. Again, if you're a first-timer, just dive in um, or you haven't been here in a while. Pharisees and scribes, these are religious leaders of the day. Maybe you know that much. They came to Jesus from Jerusalem. So this is an intentional meeting, by the way. They're, they're, they're seeking him out. They've come from Jerusalem, and they're probably higher up then because they've come from like the temple area, right? And said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. They're trying to trap him always, particularly in this last, these last weeks of his, of his life. In the last week of his life, this is not where we are yet, but we've been there. The last week of his life, they're trying to trap him and things are heating up. Um, so by now, the teachings of the elders had become elevated. Their traditions had become elevated beyond the Bible. Now, one of these was the, um, the washing ceremony, washing of hands. Now, we do find this in Exodus. So they're, you know, they're, they're coming kind of from this, this long-standing tradition. But even there, it was tied to the priests who were to wash their hands before they, they were ceremonial, ceremonially clean. And he's saying, why do your, why do your disciples not follow this. Now watch how Jesus answers. I love this. Jesus answers with a question. Because it's as if to say, okay, whatever. He didn't say that, but whatever. Let me ask you guys something. I noted recently that throughout the Gospels, we know of 307 questions that Jesus was asked. I mean, he's asked more than that, but that's how many we have recorded. And you also may, may have heard me say that. You know how many he answered out of 307? Three. Now, he often answered them implicitly or you know, through a story or something. But he often, 185 uh, times, he asked the question. Which, by the way, is a legitimate way to engage our friends and neighbors. I've learned that the new apologetic, the new defense of faith, if you want to enter into conversation with people, ask questions. That's what you do. And then you listen. You extend grace, you listen to where they are, and you, you come to understand and know where they come from. So that's to keep in mind this Easter season, even as we're inviting people to come join us. But they, um, so they, they, he, he says then, he asks them a question. And look at this, verse 3. He answered them. Okay, answered them. He questioned them. And why do, you break, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Wow. Okay, he's going to guide them to the proper perspective. Traditions lead us to a misguided perspective. If you know anything about art, 
um, you know that in a, in a painting or a drawing, there's a singular vantage point, a singular point of perspective. All your lines go back to this point. That's why things are big and, you know, and then they get smaller. Then that's how you, you draw and learn how to, how, to, how, to, how to do artwork with perspective. There's a single point that everything runs back to. If you don't have a single point, then it gets really wonky. If you have a couple of points even... It becomes a, you know, a Cezanne. It becomes a, a Van Gogh or something. And you're going, wait, that, that's weird. And that's funky perspective is what that is. Jesus is going to get them back to the point. And, and, he's, and he always does this. And it's what we must do. Notice he appeals to something beyond tradition. The commandment of Scripture is what he says in, in verse 3. Let's talk about the commandment of Scripture. You guys have turned this, yes, biblical principle into a tradition And you've placed it higher than the word of God. Look at verse 4. God commanded, honor your father and your mother. Now watch this. You're going to have to know a little historical context here, but watch this. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. This was serious in the Jewish culture, and it is for us as believers. You take care of your parents. And you take care of, in, in particular, you take care of elderly parents. You honor them. But you say, okay, so there was always this, hey, God says, okay, We're going to go back to an authority higher than our tradition. We do the same. But God says, you know, this. But you say, if anyone tells his father and his mother, or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not not honor his father. That's what they're saying. So he doesn't need to honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. He's talking about something that was called Corban. And it was a practice by which there would be something that actually belonged to your parents that was actually theirs, but you would take it and you'd say, I dedicate this to God, this thing, this property, this land, or this possession. And it was a way to tag something as given to God. But what he's saying, here was the practice, what they would do, go, nobody can touch this but me. This is mine. And, and so, what, so nobody could touch it. And so he's actually stealing from their parents, if you will, what was actually theirs, and they were using it for their own purposes. Jesus knew this. They asked him a question, and he says, let me ask you a question, because you're not honoring your parents with this practice. And look, here's the point. We must remove traditions that lead to a misguided perspective. We've got to remove them. Some traditions, watch this, are good, okay? All of us, you know, innovative, young, you know, hip, cool types, some traditions are really good. Some are not so good. We're going to, today we're going to talk about discerning between the two. They're, they're simply practices that we pass on. They can be good or bad. You have traditions in your family. I hope you do. We have traditions in our schools, don't we? Man, some schools around here, it's like, dang, y'all still doing that song out of the 60s. I mean, that's cool. But, you know, and, and then you have somebody in the PTA. Why don't we change that song that we're doing? Like, okay, you're out. You're no longer on the PTA, you know, PTO board. You're not, you're out. And the same thing happens, of course, in, in business. It can happen in the church. I don't know if y'all heard about that. Some people actually, actually think that certain traditions that, that actually are not core can, you know, cannot change, right? And, and every church has this. I want to talk about that a little bit because here's what happens. A tradition ultimate, or, or how about this? Initially, it was an innovation. Like that was somebody's great idea. Somebody like, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And that's going to point us to God. And then the innovation becomes a practice. And over time, it loses its power based on a principle, maybe, that it was founded on. And then it becomes so much of a practice, we elevate it beyond the actual Word of God. And this is possible. It's possible in your life. It's possible in in, in an organization or in a church. And over time, the tradition can actually pull us away from God. When initially, perhaps, probably, it was designed to draw us to him. Think about Jesus. Maybe you know this other story. When he was healing on the Sabbath. You remember this? And they come after him. And the same guys, they're like, there's no work on the Sabbath. And Jesus is like, "Um, okay, there's a higher law at play here. And it's the law of love. And if someone's in need then this is not really work. This is worship. This is pointing them to God. It's healing people. Are you serious? And so there's a higher law of love, and that's, how, that's what they had fallen into. They were no longer loving people. Here's, here's what I want to tell you. Again, listen. In terms of your doctrine, your theology, loving people like Jesus is excellent 
theology. That is excellent theology. Let, let love trump all of your, you know, this. Well, no, we can't do it that way. We can't do it this way. We can't. A friend of mine said the way you determine some of this is, is it salvific? It's a great theological word. Is it, does it lead to salvation? Does it lead to freedom? Does it point people to the gospel? That's what we need to be about, right? And so we, we fall in traditions like this. Even as we think about, you know, inviting our friends to come join us here at church. Somebody's like, well, I would invite friends, but, you know, I have a, I, I have a trip. I mean, I go out <laughs> to lunch, like after church, like to my favorite place every Sunday. I mean, it's, you know, it's just what I do to cramp my style. Now, if you're here with one of our members, they're going to take you to lunch today is what's going to happen. You didn't know that, but that's what they're going to do. They're going to take you to lunch today. See, some of us, well, now I can't you know, invite people to Easter. I hear that, but... Man, my family, you know, we have this big lunch. And we, it's awesome. It's all good. Or, or maybe on a given Sunday, I, you know, I go to my connect group that cramp my style. I can't really, you know, meet them here. No, no, no. Skip your connect group that day. Bring them with you. You see how this works? Even in our mind, our traditions, if you will, can get in the way of actually loving people the way that he's called us to love people. And so, again, you heard about it earlier. Just, man, I want to just challenge us towards who's your one. Right? Who's the one? And let's be prayerful about that. Let's be bold in our love. So first, our traditions can lead us to a misguided perspective. Secondly, to a what I call a misplaced priority. Jesus is going to get to the heart. We've talked about this recently, this use of the word priorities. Relatively new word, when you look at kind of how the history of words go. Priority is one. There's no such thing as priorities. The very definition is that there's one. There's only one first. And Jesus is going to point them to the main thing. He's going to move from the petty nuances and debate, tangled up details of what they want to talk about. And he moves to the highest, loftiest place, uh, which is worship of God. Now, immediately, and I've got, to, I've got to speak about this, but when we talk about worship, we often talk about the gathering. Jesus is not talking about, he's not talking, and we, then we run to music. I mean, we, music's a big part of worship in the gathering. And think about how countercultural that is. So weird. We gather together and we sing together. Like dudes that can't even sing. You know, they're singing. And we gather and we're singing. And we're not only that, we're singing to someone who's present that we cannot see. That's crazy. And awesome. <laughs> and wonderful and amazing. That's, that's so subversive. In our culture, and it's what we do. But a lot of us, we run quick to music. Jesus is talking about worship as life. And so look at what he says. Check this out. Here's the word. You hypocrites. You're wearing a mask. You're playing a role. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you. He's saying, Isaiah said it well when he said this. And notice he says, he prophesied about you. He's pointing to them. When he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Without meaning, in futility do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So he, he goes to tradition and says, man, y'all have raised these traditions, the way that you do things above the word of God. So let me ask you this. How can we discern? Here's a key question. How, do, how can we discern between good traditions and bad traditions? All right. Now, if y'all just kind of geek out with me for a minute, I think about this stuff all the time, all right? Because it's in a multi-generational church, multi-venue church. You can imagine, I've heard there are people who have different opinions in the church. And some people, I mean, how about this? There's a traditional, we call it, uh, not a great term, because that means a lot of things, a lot of people. There's a traditional service going on in Sanctuary right now. Y'all know that, right? You're not in there. For, 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 uh, for certain reasons, you're not in there. Now, some of you like me, you're like, dude, I like it all. I mean, I'm, I'm there, I'm here, I'm all over. And I'm just, you know, and I realize that's kind of rare. You know, that people, I can't worship that. I can't, uh-uh, I can't worship the that song. I can't, no, I can't. Are you kidding me? A song about Jesus? I ain't singing that. <laughs> really? Are you serious? So, you know, this is what happens. And we, we've got, here's what we got to do. we got to discern what's core. You've heard me talk about this before. What's essential? We must keep traditions that guide us to true worship. Okay? we got to keep them. All right? So that's a, a challenge here, but we got to learn how 
to discern. Think about this. We do have some good traditions. Uh, we just experienced one of them. Now, you could argue that baptism, Lord's Supper, um, those are ordinances, not just traditions. But they are, in a sense, we pass those things on because they help us remember the gospel, they, to remember what Jesus has done for us. I love this. This is a quote from Yaroslav Pelikan. All right? He's an American scholar, theologian. He was at Yale, University of Chicago. And he said this, Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And I, su- I suppose I should add, it is traditionalism that gives tradition such a bad name. There's a difference. Not all tradition is bad. There are those that are good, those that are bad. Now, here's what happens. Let me speak. If I was, if I was in the sanctuary, so Travis is bringing this same message uh, to our, 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 our folks in the, in the sanctuary. Dr. Albert Reyes is in the gym talking about this very thing. Because I'm standing in front of you, I'm going to say this. A lot of people who are hip, cool, happening, contemporary people, right? Oftentimes, we end up kind of throwing rocks at the traditionalist. Um, because we're like, no, that, no, they're doing just what they've always done, and that's just rote memory. It's stuff that they're doing. They're heartless in their singing. They just kind of do it. That's all they're doing. Uh, uh-uh. I don't want anything to do with that. Okay, first of all, how can you how can you judge someone's heart when they're worshiping? And how about if they're totally engaged in music that, yes, was written some time ago, perhaps, or hymns of the past. How can you judge them for, not, for saying, I don't think they're worshiping God, because I don't worship God when we're doing that. Not so much. I, who's that? That might be more on you than them. Think about it. I was in the sanctuary a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago now. I just want to tell you this little story. I'm up there. I'm singing away. We're singing it as well. We're belting it out. And I'm like, this song is legit. <laughs> this song is so awesome. It is well with my soul. Um, Horatio Spafford wrote this song. You know the story behind that. It's amazing. So we're singing this. I'm looking up in the choir. There's one of our gals. She's, she's, she's elderly. She's a grandmother. And she's up there singing. And, and she is weeping and singing. Have you ever tried? That's hard to do, weeping and singing at the same time. And I knew why. Because just the week before, she was at her grandson's funeral speaking. And I mean, when I saw her, I'm like, oh my gosh. And then I start to weep. Because she's singing with everything she's got. And she's, she's either, you know, I don't know. She's either going, I believe this. I want to believe this. I know this is true. But it's a song that she knew from her past, right? There's a tradition worth passing on. Am I right? It's why we sing hymns even here. In this, in this particular service, there are certain songs that kind of... Isn't it, how cool is this that we sing songs that are like 500 years old? I mean, as Baptists, we go way back. We don't go pre-Reformation so much. But we sing songs. We sing... Um, uh, how about this? Um, a Mighty Fortress. Anybody know who wrote that? Martin Luther. How legit is that? We're singing like Martin Luther from the, from the Reformation. And my point is this. We didn't show up yesterday. In our practices, even, yes, some of our songs, some of the things we do, gosh, some of what we do goes back a couple millennia. That's legit. In a world that says, what's the latest, greatest, what, what's the coolest and latest thing? Because, see, on the other side, if it's, yes, traditionalism can go wrong. You can sing out of rote memory. Oh, yeah. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need I know this song. I need you. Really? Or are you, is you, are you engaged? See, it can happen here. Give us about two weeks. We'll form traditions. And, and so my, my challenge is I'm just here to, you know, kind of advocate. But for us all to say the way we know that we've arrived as a church is to celebrate all of it. And I love all of it. I praise God that we have a have a church that is multi-generational, multi-ethnic. But we always run, we run kind of quickly to, to worship. I think Jesus would say this, with all that talk and all that kind of stuff, he'd say, are you worshiping? Is your heart in it, or, or is it just your mouth maybe in it? I hope you're clinging to what you know is true in these songs that we sing. This past week as a staff, we were in staff worship together, and we were singing, uh, Come Thou Fount. There's another old one. And in it, there's a line that says, uh, now I raise mine Ebenezer. Do y'all know this hymn? And sometimes you're singing that going, what? 
I don't know what. Let me just think about Ebenezer. I don't know. Ebenezer. Scrooge? Who is that? What is this? <laughs> and so there are practices. We've got, to, you know, we've got to make things accessible and understandable. But in our scripture reading this week, it was that. We saw it. Did you see it? It's where it was a, it was a rock of hope. I'm going to raise, I'm going to place my Ebenezer. I'm going to put it there so when I see it, I'm reminded how awesome God is. That's what that's about. And so, yes, there's education and such when you get into some of these things. But here's what I want us to see, and, I'm going to, and we'll press on. But this is so important for us as a church. Let's get our minds around this. Uh, Rupert Meldinius, a very little, less, less little known theologian, he said it this way. You've probably heard something like this. In all things essential, unity. In all things non-essential, liberty. In all things charity. Now, a lesser, much lesser known theologian um, put it this way. In all things core, unity. In all things non-core, freedom. In all things grace. All right? That's how I like to talk about it. That, that when, if it's core, then we are not going to budge. And watch this. By definition, if it's core, it does not change. Everything else is open to change. Now, Jim Collins writes about this in his book a long time ago, book, uh, Built to Last. Preserve the core, stimulate progress. Preserve the core, stimulate progress. When I read that, I was like, bam, that's the church. That is who we are as a church. We've got to constantly do this. But here's the key. Define what's core. You've got to be clear about what's core. What is core? The gospel. The gospel and everything, yes, that comes out of the gospel, um, the fact that we're saved by grace, the fact that, yes, I'm a sinner. No, I was a sinner. Now I'm a saint. The gospel is central. Everything else is open, open season, just about. Let's take a little test. How about this? Um, core or non-core? Jesus. Uh, core. It'd be core. Um, how about this? Um, singing hymns, core or non-core? Not core. Singing the latest, greatest, hippest hill song. song. Core, non-core. Not core. Gathering in the church on Sunday mornings to sing to the Lord. Core, non-core. Ooh. Here's where I'm going. Worship. Core or non-core? Okay, how about this? Um, small group Bible study. Core or non-core? <laughs> Sunday school. Core or non-core? Discipleship, core or non-core. There's lots of ways to do that. You see where that? See how this goes? I thought Sunday school was core. Mm -mm. There are people. I mean, call it what you will, I guess. But yes, gathering around God's word. I'd say that's central to what we do. See, here's the point: you got to go from essence to form, core versus style or structure. Those things change constantly. And here's the deal: if you make something that is not core, core. Or if you take what's core and you say that's not core, in theological circles, that's called heresy is what that is. And we do it. When we apply something and say that's core and it cannot change. And, and he said, no, no, no. And, and, and so many of us have, have, have wrestled with that. So let's keep pressing along. Watch this. Thirdly, okay, so misguided perspective, misplaced priority. Spent more time on that one. Thirdly, misdirected purpose. It leads us to a false purpose. Watch this, verse 10. And he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. All right. I love that. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. Okay. So your, your cleanliness and whatever, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. And, and he's, he's point, pointing out that because whatever comes out of the mouth is what's in the heart. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak is what he says in Matthew. Uh, I think it's 16. And then, look at this, and then it says, verse 12, Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you not, and now he's with the disciples, Do you know that the, the disciples, I like the, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when, when they heard you saying that? <laughs> and I think, I wish that the text said, And Jesus smiled. I like that. You know? I wish that it said, <laughs> Jesus giggled. You know, but it doesn't say that. Um, and then in verse 13, he answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has planted will be rooted up. What's he saying? Their traditions are going to be exposed. They're going to be torn up. They're going to be pulled up and proven not to sustain. So here's the question. Here's a diagnostic question. Do our traditions encourage longevity? 
That's what he's saying there. Are we passing on the gospel to the next generation? Some traditions do that. Some don't. If they don't, they've got to go, is what Jesus would say. All right, let's press on. Verse 14, he goes on. He says this, let them alone. They are blind guides. Don't follow people who aren't encouraging longevity, passing the gospel on. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Another diagnostic question. Do our traditions pass down truth? He said, they're not passing on the truth. They're not passing on God's word. So listen, this is why everything we do, all we talk about is from God's word. It's why we teach it and preach it. And we look at the text and we apply it. It's what we do in every connect group. It's what we do with our children, with our youngest ones. God's word is our authority. All right. And we do this together in community. Now we have a special opportunity. I got a shout out to all of our men. I want you to come join me this Saturday. We're going to be here in this room at seven o'clock as men. And we're going to talk about what it is to act like men. And so we're going to have just a single event where we're all coming together uh, here right in the midst of springtime, leaning toward Easter. It's going to be an incredible time. It's good for men to get together. So come and join us 7 to 8. You're out into the day. But come join us this Saturday. I hope you'll be with us. Look at this. Here's another one. So here's, we must pass on traditions that make disciples, that make real disciples. That's what we do. Look at number four. It leads us to a mistaken purity. In verse 15 through 20. Now, traditions of men focus on us. This is what Jesus is saying here. And Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. Literally. Look at verse 15. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you, are you also still without understanding? Y'all, the message, the translation, it says, it says, you too? Are you being willfully stupid? <laughs> I don't know if Jesus said that, but that's... That's close. Are you, just, are you trying to be dumb? You know, sorry. He said worse than that to Peter, though, didn't he? At other points, say, mm. okay, verse 17. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, verse 18. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This is, this, and this defiles a person. It's not just your words, it's what, it's what it reveals. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person. He's like, that's neither here nor there. He's saying, let's talk about what matters here. And so out of this list, and I want to land on this to make the point, and then we're going to pray as we, as we close our time together. He goes through this list. Uh, so here, check this out. Murder. Okay, I don't know that anybody in the room has murdered someone. Um, in the crowd this side. Okay, adultery. Probably. Sexual morality. Okay, this is, this is the word pornea, which is all kinds of sexual sin. All of us. I mean, if you're like past... Eight years old, you know, you're all of us, okay. Theft, mm -hmm. false witness, slander. I mean, he's going down the list. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands, that no, that's that's no big thing. So here's what happens: traditions lead us to a false sense of purity. In other words, I've done that. I keep that rule. I do that, and I do that. I'm pure. Now let me just grab from sexual immorality. Let's talk about that for a minute, just because it's prevalent. And it's Satan's easiest door to shame. And it's something we all wrestle with. You know, I was a youth minister for lots of days, uh, or lots of years, and, and back in the day we used to, hey, true love waits, true love waits, true love waits, you know, wait. And that's a great message, by the way. Because that's God's way. But if we're not careful, here's what we do. We make sexual purity um, a, a kind of a destination. Or we make it uh, into an accomplishment. Tracking with me? And so, hey, if you make it to your wedding night without having sex, bam, you're pure. You did it. You've never had an a impure sexual thought before? You've, ne you've not entered into other forms of sexual sin and pornography? or Are you pure? Really? You see, my point is, purity is not based on how good I am. Right? Purity is not a destination. 
Purity is a relationship with a person. And here's how I want to land this message. What Jesus is talking about is what makes a person pure. And what we know through Scripture, what He teaches us is this. Purity comes from Him, the one who is pure. That's a different ballgame altogether. It's not based on me, how well I've done. Did I make it to this point without you know, entering into sexual sin? Or No, we're all sexual sinners. Every one of us. Your pastor is. And yet, God has shown me, He's forgiven me of anything from my past. He is the one who makes me pure. It's why 1 John 3, verse 3 says, And everyone who, who thus hopes in Him purifies himself. He's the one who makes us pure just as he is pure. So do our traditions pass down hope? Some of us, we enter into, oh, I, I've sinned, I've fallen. Think about that. I, I, I've fallen into sin. I didn't make it to my wedding night. I guess I'm, and bam, I might as well just give up. If that was the goal, that's a good goal. Don't miss this. But imagine this. Instead, what if we were to say, no, 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 no. You know what the Lord wants? He wants to give you a new heart. So you actually want to be pure out of this new identity he's given you. And so look at what he does here. He quotes from Isaiah 29, 13. Then he goes to, uh, if you were to keep going, and these guys knew this, this passage. It says this. It's on the screen there. You can see it. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people. The people he just rebuked and said, you, your, your hearts are far from me. But I'm going to do a new thing with wonder upon wonder and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. He says, your traditions will come and go. I'm going to give you a new heart. That's what you need. You can't be pure on your own. Christ alone is the one who makes us pure. So sexual sin, any sin, all sin. He has come to set us free because He died on the cross for our sin. So we don't have to be punished. He lived the perfect life for you because you couldn't. He becomes your substitute, not just your good example, right? He dies and He's raised again so that we might be raised again as we saw in baptism to be totally forgiven and now live a new life with Him as Lord of our lives. Purity comes through relationship with Him, the one who is pure. And He gives us a new heart so that we can overcome sin. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For our sake He made Him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Praise be to God for this amazing gift that He's given to us. Let's pray together as we close our time. I want you to consider your life, friend. God's been speaking to you. Our traditions can lead to a misguided perspective, a misplaced priority, a misdirected purpose, and a mistaken purity. But the great exchange means that we can praise Him. And so, Lord, we praise You with our lives. We give You our lives. I pray, God, that You would touch every heart here, people that don't know You, that You would, yeah, Friend, give your heart to Him right now. So we might praise the name of the Lord our God with our lives. Lord, thank You for Your grace. Thank You for Your forgiveness, Your righteousness, purity that covers us. We give You our lives anew. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.